out of the book of Numbers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Numbers, chapter 23, verse 24. I was talking to my pastor this morning. I said, nowhere in the Bible does the Scripture ever say that God, bah, from the heavens. You never hear God go, bah, from the heavens. You always hear God roar. He always roars from the heavens. And we took this thought over the last few weeks in dealing with the distinct nature of sheep and lions and that we start out as believers as sheep. But God never intends for you to stay a sheep because sheep do not take dominion. The Scripture in the beginning of the Word of God teaches us, and I believe that God, when He says something in the beginning, He, he sets a, a precedence all the way through. And when He does that, He said that we would take dominion over the earth. As a man who uh, helps look after 110 acres, I can tell you this, that if you don't take dominion over the earth, it'll take dominion over you. You better mow the grass. You better get the vines back. You got to take care of the trees when they fall. You got to look after the animals that are there. You have to take dominion. Sheep don't take dominion. Sheep graze with their head down, and they do whatever the shepherd says. It's important to understand a lot of pastors, again, they love to pastor sheep because then they can manipulate them and intimidate them and make them come to church or do whatever else. I'm glad you're here on your own free will. I'm glad nobody didn't tell you you had to come here to go to heaven. Amen. I'm glad you just love God and you just love being with God's people. Amen. Hear the Word of God and being obedient to the Word of God. But Numbers 23, 24 is a prophetic look at God's people, and it says, Look, a people rising to its feet, stretching like a lion, a king, the king of the beast, aroused, unsleeping, unresting until its hunt is over and it's eaten and drunk its fill. This was the word of God concerning the children of Israel that had grown so much. And if I could tell you real quickly the rest of the story, that's when we get, a, uh, we get Balaam. You remember Balaam? Balaam? Balaam's running around and, and he's on his ass. I mean, on his donkey, my bad. We want, to, we want to go King James to the message here. I don't know. He said, we go King James. He was riding on his ass on the message. It was a donkey. But you understand. And then he gets, uh, and so they tried to talk him into going over and, and prophesying against the children of Israel. Why? Because they'd grown up like lions. They had been, they rose from their sleep. And he said, these people have become great. These people have started doing exploits. And then, of course, the donkey, quote, started talking to him. He meant God can use the donkey. Look at your neighbor and smile at him. Don't say anything. Just smile at him. Amen. If God can use a donkey, smile at your neighbor. Amen. That's what I'm saying. Father, bless the word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. I believe that trap within every follower of Christ is a hidden leader. In other words, in every sheep there has to be a lion. It's, in, it's discovering yourself. And as I walk you through this, I want to tell you that I have discovered more and more who I am and what I am by staying in the Word of God and sticking with God for all these years. When I first got into church world, I just heard what, you know, I was uh, in the world, in the church, and, and I listened to what they said, and then I went to Bible college, and, you know, it was pretty much the same thing for four years, and got a bachelor's, but there was always something that drove me, that uh, there was a passion in my life for purpose and to, to, uh, to do a little bit more than what I was just seeing in the regular church world. And for some, it may have looked like it got me in trouble, but actually it, it made me a more, just a little more aggressive. And I've never backed off on this. And if you've heard some of this, you need to hear it again. And if you're new, I want you to kind of open up your mind here and listen. Amen. Every one of us needs to have a discovery of who we really are. Unique mental attitude. Your self-worth. You're valuable to God. You matter to others. It creates a strong, positive, a confident person. When I studied the lion, and again, I, I watch a lot of documentaries now as I get older, that and the Food Channel, and then when I'm watching that, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up on the fact, and I, I love the, the, the hyena, and I, I love the elephant, and the, and the alligators, and the reptiles. And As a matter of fact, I, I had a thought, just a thought. That, you know, we're called Camp Holy Wild. I thought about getting some exotics out on the property, you know. Hey, Amen. I, I, what, what would I do? Bring some bison and some, some emus and, and uh, bring out some, you know. Or maybe I just open up your house, David, and kick all the animals that you've collected, all the reptiles out. But, you know, so people could see stuff when they come by because they love exotics. I ain't saying I will. I'm just saying it was a thought. Hey, Amen. But often my thoughts get me in a lot of trouble. Amen. They start, and it was, when I told my son that, he said, Dad, who's going to feed them? And I smiled at him. 
Amen. You know, I mean, maybe my idea, but that don't mean I got to do it. Can I get an amen? So the lion, I love lions. I love to learn about them. A lion roars for a number of reasons, and most frequently he wants his presence to be known. Amen. And God wants you to, you're the presence of God in your life to be known. His roar causes fear in the hearts of his enemies. When you get up in the morning, it should be, oh, no, you're up. Amen. The devil should make note that you're up now. You're, you're on the move now. Amen. His roar can be heard five miles away. It warns trespassers to leave the territory that is inhabited by the pride. That's why you tell evil to go. The roar can be used to contact the pride members. It's the way we speak to one another. The roar, and, and I can't take away from the fact the roar often is your praise. Amen. When you lift your praise, when you open your mouth, sir, amen, and you tell God how much you love him, that's your roar. A roar strengthens social bonds. Many times her pride will roar in chorus, and it always accompanies an aggressive action. When I roar, it tells, you know, I, my, my Sunday gets rolled, and it tells me my Monday going to be good. Amen, because my roar is on then. The book of Hosea, chapter 11, verse 10 says, they will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Who's he? God will. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. That word roars, the Hebrew word shock, which means thunder. When you hear the thunder, <laughs> when you hear the thunder, imagine that's God roaring from his heavens. Amen. And it just does something to you. I walked out in a rainstorm there in Utah this week, and I stood outside. I, I know everybody thinks it's a little nuts, but, man, I, I've been looking for rain for so long. And, and I stood out there, and we're on this lake called Lake Stansbury, and the wind's white capping it, man. And, I mean, it's pushing it across and stuff. I'm having to grab all the, the little pillows off of the little chairs and put them up. I mean, stuff flying everywhere. And I'm standing out there, and I just got my hands out, and I go, look at what the Lord is doing. Amen. I can hear the roar. I can see the lightning in, in the background. It felt so good. I never run from the storm. I like being near the storm. Amen. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a back porch setter from, from back home. When the storms hit, I like to sit out in the storm and listen to it. Somebody said, well, you could get hit with lightning. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. There was a time I wouldn't have appreciated that, but the older I get, the more I say, Lord Jesus, you do what you do, and then y'all can put it on my stone. God killed him. But this spirit, this leadership spirit we've talked about the last few weeks in Gideon, we talked about uh, uh, Shamgar with a, with a post, with a stick that, that took out 600 Philistines. Talked about Deborah, the bee last night. All you queen bees, give me an amen. 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 It inspires others to have hope in the face of great odds and causes the leader to cultivate a spirit of purpose. There's daring in it and passion and, and conviction. But until a person's spirit is changed, the person remains unchanged. So when God came into your life, he came in to change your life, amen, to give you, to make you just a little bit different than what you were. Every human has this instinct capacity for leadership. I know that we, a lot of us were taught that there are only a few leaders and a whole lot of followers. That's not true. Everybody in here is a leader. Amen. You're a leader in the sphere of your family. Mama, you're a leader. Daddy, you're a leader. You're a leader at work. You're a leader at school. You're a leader wherever you go. Amen. Be that leader that God calls you to be. So everybody has that. To be a lion. But most of us, we won't do it because it takes courage to stand up and, and to lead, to lead our families. Amen. I can tell you this, uh, that status does not create leadership. Titles doesn't create leadership. A position given doesn't make you a leader. Just because somebody gave you a, a title, amen, that doesn't make you a leader. Genuine leadership is one's internal disposition, which relates to a sense of purpose. When you're around somebody that has a purpose and a desire and a passion, there's something about it. Then you know, okay, that guy's a leader, that woman's a leader, and I could be that too. True leadership is a product of inspiration, not manipulation. Amen. You don't have to manipulate people to, be, to follow you. You can just inspire them with the way you live. Sometimes you can use words. But mainly, an example for you to have. Amen. True leaders do not seek power, but are driven by a passion to achieve a noble cause. We're all created to fulfill a specific purpose. I believe everybody here has a purpose in life. And God puts you here. Every time I do a funeral, I remind people, you are here for a purpose. Amen. Find that purpose. Discover it. Amen. And your life will light up like a light bulb. So our assignment determines our arena of leadership. Deep inside of all of us, I think this is on the overhead here. Amen. Deep inside all of us is a spirit with a big dream, struggling to free itself from the limitations of our past experiences, present circumstances, and self-imposed doubts. It's trying to break free, amen, to, to what you thought you would never be. Uh, when you talk to leaders and they hear words like this, when, uh, let me just shift that word. When you talk to lions, 
And you say words like passion, initiative, teamwork, innovation, persistence, discipline, focus, time management, confidence, positive disposition, patience, peace, compassion. It lights up inside of them. Amen. They love to hear those words. It ignites them. Amen. It does something to them. I heard this uh, by, by uh, Miles Monroe, Pastor Miles, who passed away a few years ago. He made this statement, and I pondered it. I mean, I had to sit there and think about it. It's not on overhead, but listen, an army of sheep led by a lion will always defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. Let me say it again, because you've got to ponder this statement. Oh, it is on overhead. Thank you, Jesus. My memory skipped me because I wouldn't put it there. <laughs> an army of sheep led by a lion will always defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. Why is that, Pastor? Because if lions are led by sheep, they act like sheep. And if you can be a lion amongst a whole lot of sheep, and all you want to do is go, bah, bah. but inside of you, eventually, you were born to roar. You were born to, to lead. You were born to have a little more influence than what you think you've got. Amen. So it's important to understand if a sheep lead them, but their lions ain't going to do any good. But if lions lead them, guess what? The sheep will become like the leader. Therefore, the scripture says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen. The tribe of praisers. What we're waiting on is for leaders to rise up. Amen. The greatest leadership seems to surface during times of personal, social, economic, political, and spiritual conflict. When I read that, I thought to myself, this is what's happened in our nation. We've had judges rise up. It wasn't the leaders. It wasn't the potentates of the presidents. Amen. It was the judges that rose up during a time of tremendous conflict and made powerful decisions. Amen. I thank God for that. Can I get an amen? Amen. So even in our own lives, for us to learn to rise up and move. I, Moses, Esther, uh, you know, all of these rose up uh, during a time to save the Jews from annihilation. Nehemiah to rebuild a wall. Of course, you know about Corey Ten Boom who took, uh, 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 saved Jews by putting them underground of her house. Amen. And, you know, if you know anything about Corey's life, I'll just read you just a little bit. Corey Ten Boom was 50 years old when the Nazis invaded Holland. She discovered her purpose during the per persecution of the Jews by hiding them in a secret room in her home. Their passion so strong, they risked their lives for its fulfillment. After being found out, Corey's dad died in prison. Her sister died in a concentration camp. Corey herself endured prison work camp and concentration camp before execution was released on a clerical error. In other words, she was going to be executed, but there was an error that got her uh, free. And she wrote a book about healing and forgiveness known as The Hiding Place. She even forgave the German guards who beat her sister to death. My friend, that's a lion. That's a lion. It's not a sheep. That's a lion right there to do what she did. A belief, inspirational, is a divine deposit of destiny in the heart of a person. It is the opposite of intimidation and manipulation. So lasting change can only occur when it takes place in the spirit of the mind. Somewhere up here, this thing's got to shift. i got to shift from being just out in the field to the king of the jungle. Amen. With a roar. would say to myself, and again, it's not to control people. We don't control people, amen, but we look after our own selves and we lead and we got by inspiration, amen. It inspires others to have hope. So I go to 2 Samuel. Now I'm to my sermon. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty men. When you think again about lions, you've got to think about King David. This boy who took on a Goliath. With a, with a rock and a sling and a song. This man who, who just uh, amazing stuff, took out Philistines. Uh, uh, he feigned madness one time, and he even had Goliath's sword with him, and he went and hid in the cave, and 400 discontented, in debt, uh, discouraged men found him in the cave, and he turned these men into mighty men. And the Scripture says of three of them, and the first guy, we'll just call him uh, uh, Joseph and leave it like that was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. 
Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahohite, as one of the three mighty men. He was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Postdamon for battle. When the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground and he struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Verse 11 is not on the overhead, but his name was Shama, the son of Aji. Amen. And there was a piece of ground full of beans, a bean field known as lentils. And I think they make up uh, uh, tofu out of that. I ain't for sure. But it's a, a bean like that. If you've never ate tofu, don't. <laughs> and the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of of the pea patch, and he defended it, and he slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. In the life of David, he mentored warriors, young lions who were driven with passion toward purpose, unleashing tremendous potential to do the impossible. Eliezer was one of them. We'll just talk about him this morning and walk through this. He had a passion for purpose, and I can tell you that is contagious. He was with David. The word posdamon, that's where it says he's with him gathered there. It was a place of communion, the blood, the covenant. You know, when we gather and we have communion here, that's our postdomin. It's our place of memory. Amen. It's a gathering place. We've bled together. We've worked together. Amen. We gave together. We did everything together. This is what it's saying, that when this man Eliezer was with David, amen, this is where he was with him. They hung out together. That place was a place of communion. It was a place of being contagious, if you would. Uh, how do you become like you are? Let me tell you why you are the way you are. It's the people you hang out with. It's the people that you've influenced at work or influenced you. It's the people you've been to church with that you influenced and influenced you. It's the people you brought up around your whole life. And this guy was around David. Around, and being around David, it was contagious. I believe we need to catch the lion flu. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. No, no more of that sheep stuff. But a lot, but some type of courage that rises up in you and challenges you and changes you. Now, now, Pastor Rich, I did not know that you were going to be here this morning. Amen. I didn't, I didn't know that. You told me you were going to be here last week. You lied, but you showed up today, and that's okay. You're forgiven. Go in peace. Sin no more. But, but the bottom line here is this. That, that man and I have been together through a lot of stuff. No matter what you think, our hearts are knit because of things we've gone through. And there was a time in my life when, when this thing rose up in me, and I didn't understand the lion. I didn't know it, but I knew this. After nine years of marriage, I had no children. And the more I studied, the more I understood about the aborting of babies. And, and, and it will break your heart. It, just, it breaks my heart because I'm seeing pastors who are posted. I can't believe so many quote-unquote Christians are, are mad about this flip with the Roe v. Wade thing. And, and I, I sat back and I'm, I've not got on it. People have actually sent me messages saying, you know, this ought to really thrill you. It does thrill me, but we should never even have a law dealing with this. Because this is life inside of here. And if you've ever seen an abortion, if you've ever seen a, a, a child scream inside of the womb on a sonogram when they reach inside with a forceps and a scaffold, amen, in order to remove his head. If you've never seen the baby scream before, then you don't understand the, the, the passion and the understanding of abortion. As they dismember the child. See, it's never stopped from the time of 2 Samuel chapter 3 and chapter 4 when they were dismembering people. They haven't stopped doing that. And they dismembered the child and they pulled him out through the suction of a vacuum cleaner and they can say Sell that fetal material to cosmetic companies. Follow the money, my friend. It's always been about the money. It's always been about the millions that people have made on the death of children. Amen. So, yes, I say to the mamas, rise up. To the daddies, rise up. And so because of this, a passion got inside of me, and I found myself with my, my, my first wife. Yeah, I've got a first wife and a second wife. I'm an Old Testament character. I have multiple wives. Amen. And so... I, my first wife, Connie, and I went to, went, to, went to stand in front of an abortion clinic. Richard and his wife, Joyce, followed me to the abortion clinics in Austin. We stood there in the frigid cold. You remember it, Rich? Amen. For hours, you're standing there. You didn't take a break to go potty. You stood there, and you struggled with it. You dealt with it. You sang together. And then when they arrested you, they put you down. They handcuffed you, and they threw you in a wagon, and they hauled you off to jail. And after a while, Rich, you served time. I forget how many weeks you were in. How, many, how long was you in? 15 days. I beat you by a week. But either way, the, the, you know, the, we don't talk about the humiliation of being stripped down and being watched by female guards when you're in the shower and things of that nature. But we went through it. I walked in the courthouse with my Bible, and I stood there in front of that judge. I thought they would just dismiss my case. But uh-uh, they wanted to make an example of us. 
to stop us from doing what we were doing. Next thing we knew, the youth group in which we pastored, they were doing crazy stuff while we were in jail. Amen. We tried, what happened? Why did that happen? They were contagious. It was contagious. Amen. There was a connection here because the lions had risen up. What's happened in our church this day? We ain't got no people that are contagious anymore. And I'm not picking on this house. I'm just telling you the church alive. That if we got into a place and we were, once again, again, standing for right things, and we stood up for it, and we loved our kids no matter what, we pressed through, amen, it, it, it changes. So I come back, I come back out of jail. Rich, there was a girl, I'm trying to, her name was Christina, just came to me, Hispanic, beautiful girl, wearing long black Harley shirts, big ones. Didn't even know she was pregnant, 16 years old, going to abort the baby. We come back out of jail, she keeps the child. She actually asked us, do you want it? We did. We did. Next thing I know, next thing I know, uh, her mother found out, and her mom said, let's keep it. I met that teenage girl. I met that little girl who would have been aborted. I, don't care. I told my pastor this this morning. I would not be the father of three adopted kids had I not done what I'd done. I know that in my heart because people knew our passion. And they would call us when we were on the road and say, hey, there's an 11-month-old girl that needs a mom and dad. Y'all want her? Yeah, we want her. Do you know what? We never asked if she was purple or pokey dot. We didn't ask about her health. We didn't ask nothing. We went and got that kid. God help me. That's a wild child I got hold of. <laughs> Travis some more, got the phone call again. Another one. Got here to Houston, got the phone call again, another one. Amen. Passion is a powerful thing, but when it's contagious, when it's contagious, it does something. Now, let me say something on a secular note real quick. I saw Elvis twice. You know why? That dude had passion. He had, he had the hip, I know all that, but he learned that in church. Come on. Look at the history. Some of y'all, y'all learned y'all dance moving other places on Saturday. You ought to learn it in church. Can I get an amen? Amen. He learned that in church. But there was passion about it. I love people that have passion. They're contagious. But we need to be on the, on the, on the God side. Can I get an amen? Amen. Passion for purpose. It takes courage. Hallelujah. When the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground. In other words, there were people that left. Not everybody gets contagious. Not everybody catches it. Sometimes you've got to stand alone. And so everybody's gone. He's standing there by himself. Courage is the ability to face difficulty or danger with firmness. One man with courage, my friend, has become a majority. It separates. What separates courage from normality is determination in the face of danger, not education or pedigree or finances. Passion for purpose, it hangs on to. The Bible says his hand was welded. That's the term it uses in the Hebrew language. It welded to his sword. It clave to adhere, cling, stick, catch by pursuit. It, 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 even though he was tired, even when you're tired, hang on. Hang on to the sword. Amen. This thing gives you balance. This thing fights your enemies. Amen. This thing pierces the darkness. This thing puts light in, in other people's life. This book right here, this sword, the sword of the Lord, this book, when you cleave, I'm tired. I don't want to read the Bible no more. Don't you say that. Don't you say that. You hang on to your book. Amen. In a world that's gone stupid, gone stupid, putting feminine products in boys' bathrooms, gone stupid. The world's gone stupid. And, and, and people are defending this nonsense. Man, I, again, you can love people without defending the nonsense. Amen. And I look at this and say, this is nonsense. This is stupid. But we fall in hook, line, and sinker. Hallelujah. So we got to hang on to something that's relative, something that's solid. Solid. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's keep going, preacher. I'm about to finish it. I told you I was at my message, but it was halfway through. Passion for purpose always completes its task. Always completes its task. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge will give me on that day and to all those who love his appearing. I kept, my, I kept the race. This week, two good friends of mine, well, actually, one I knew, the other one was a good friend, passed away. In their passing, I thought they kept the faith. One of them was Bill Calise. He sat right back over here. Twyla's daddy. 
Bucky's daddy. Sit right back over here. Passed away this week. I was with him in the hospital before I went out of town. He kept the faith. You know, we got this thing backwards about death. We leave in the land of dying, going to the land of the living. Amen. The lions aren't scared of, of death. It's learning how. And I, I asked Twyla yesterday, I said, tell me about your dad. She said, Pastor. He said, let me go be with Jesus. And he closed his eyes and he passed away. When we learn how to live right, we need to learn how to die right. Amen. Because we're going to lose this earth suit, put on a new suit. Can I get an amen? amen? There's something I like, and that's a new suit. When I travel, I always buy stuff. One day I'm going to travel out of this suit, and I'm going to travel and get a new suit. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Passion to complete a purpose. Jesus' last words on the cross, it's finished. It's finished. Amen. He said, Paul's last words, I fought a good fight. You can't just tag it. You got to complete it. Many of you realize that you started serving God a long time ago. Well, let me tell you what God said. Book of Philippians, he said, the work that he begun in you, he was going to complete it. He's going to keep it going until, not, not until you think you're done, but until Jesus comes again. In other words, he never gives us the end of the race. We run a race, but the end ain't till the end. Amen. Until the end here with us. Hallelujah. My prayer that whatever is good inside of me that I can transfer to you. Let me tell you, I'm around Pastor Joseph, Pastor David a whole lot. But there's things about me I never want to see in these young men. There's things inside of me I would love to see in their lives. And I've seen it. And they, in return, have put life inside of me. Amen. With what they have learned. And this is what you do when you hang out with folk, other lions. Can I get an amen? Amen. In the synagogue, Jesus was 12 years old. When he said, I must be about my father's business. I think that's a TCB. Taking care of business. Uh-huh. At the well with the woman, he said, I must finish the work of him who sent me. In John 9, he said, I must work the work of him who sent me. This is the spirit of leadership. It's a roar that comes up inside of you. You know, I've had passions for a lot of things in life. Hot rods, horses, of course, guns with horses, hunting, fishing with my grandson. My passion was for him, not for fishing. I've had a lot of passion for, I started working out a couple of years ago, just for, had some passion with that. But all of those things are small compared to the passion that God puts inside of you for the purpose in this life. Amen. Amen. That's to love people. That's to know Christ and to make him known. I'm praying in the name of Jesus that not just this church, but even through the issues of the internet, that we'll see people rise up and no longer be sheep, but go into a new dimension in their life and their thinking to become lions in Jesus' name. Amen? In Jesus' name. We call this place the Church of the Holy Wild.